I will sort of ease into my discussion about design issues uh, by way of talking about my study and talking about some examples of longitudinal research, which I hope kind of complement some of the things we heard about this morning, uh, and then get into uh, some of what we think we know or don't know about um, longitudinal study design. So uh, the health retirement study has been mentioned a couple of times already. Uh, it has a number of key features. Uh, it's public use. We get the data out to the research community within a few months of the close of the data collection. Uh, it is longitudinal. Uh, it's very multidisciplinary. We cover a lot of uh, ground in terms of the content of the study. I like to think of it as innovative, certainly busy and we're never doing the same thing twice as soon as I even though it's not to do. One of my colleagues, who now also works on the PSRD, coined the term some time ago to describe the HRS short the two uh, which means you do it for two or three ways and then you want to do something else, uh, as opposed to logic here for you uh, the study is nationally representative as I'll talk a little bit in a minute, uh, is increasingly uh, part of the international network of uh, online studies. Uh, one of the key metrics we track uh, to uh, make sure we're doing our jobs uh, is how the users of the data are doing uh, with uh, what we uh, give out to them. Uh, and you'll see, and I think this is important for those of you thinking about how to evaluate longitudinal studies as they ramp up. Uh, the HRS started in 1992. You see how few publications there were even by 1994, uh, and then it's been building uh, over the first 20 years of the study at an increasing pace to where it's now uh, over 120 uh, papers a year for the last uh, five years. So um, we, we think that's a pretty good output. We'd always be glad to see more, but uh, that's uh, a pretty gratifying uh, example of this. Uh, the HRS uh, was not designed uh, kind of from birth to be what it is now. Uh, it very much evolved over time, both in sample and in content, I think you a little sense of that. So this is, uh, actually this is a simple version of the sample design, uh, because we interview uh, couples, both partners in couple households, um, the cohorts are defined by the joint distribution of ages in the households. So I've, I've shown it because I'm not interested in individuals. But the study began in 1992 with uh, what was then called the HRS cohort, people who were then 51 to 61 years old, and the idea was to capture people just before the retirement decisions were going to be made uh, and then follow them through retirement. Uh, and, uh, they really hadn't thought much beyond that. First thing, that happened then was concern about the older part of the population, which led to a second cohort called the HED, uh, being introduced in 1993, and that was people 70 years of age and older in 1993. Those two cohorts uh, have been interviewed uh, ever since then. Now we're on a two-year basis with all of them. Uh, and then in 1998, uh, we finally arrived at what we think of now as sort of the standard for an HRS type study that uh, was described this morning, which is trying to represent the population 50 years of age and older. We did that by adding the cohort that was missing in between these two birth cohorts, uh, which we call the children of the depression age. Uh, and we added our first refresher cohort. One of the problems with aging studies is people get older. So you see this diagram as time goes forward, age goes up. So the only way you stay representative of the 50 plus population is to bring new people in periodically uh, to refresh it. And that's a challenge. Uh, I'm not going uh, to spend a lot of time talking about it. It's one of our uh, main uh, challenges to uh, maintain the study of the so what we've been able to do since then is every six years, we introduce a new six-year birth cohort to refresh the sample. So uh, what we call the early baby boom, the 53 birth cohort, the mid baby boom, and then next year, uh, the late baby boom, 1960 to 65. And that's the way uh, a cohort study uh, can stay population representative of, uh, of a nation. Uh, this just gives you an idea of the sample size. I tried to match the colors of what they were on the previous slide. Um, and so you see what happens is um, 
So the red at the top, that was the people 70 years of age and older, and they're dying out very rapidly. So the number of people left in the winter is getting quite small. Uh, the code of code is also getting old. The HRS now are about 75 to 85, so they're starting to experience significant mortality now uh, as well. And then you see each of the uh, new cohorts uh, coming in. And so our goal now is to try and maintain this on a steady state basis, uh, which would give us about 20,000 interviews in an average way, uh, is to add a new cohort of about 5,000 people uh, every six years to replace the deaths uh, that occur in the old cohort. So we are a longitudinal study, but we're also very much in the cross-section of the uh, as good as that as we can. So one of the main virtues, I believe, of having a standing population representative longitudinal study is you can use it as a launching pad for specialists. So in an interview, you can only cover so much ground. We try to pack a lot in. Our interviews run uh, close to two hours on the telephone and two and a half to three hours in person. person. Uh, so we're pushing the limits, the limits of the uh, So we really can't add much more to the main interview, but we do see these other things uh, in between the waves or as specialized uh, coverage. So the largest of these are in-depth studies focused on specific types of problems. So dementia, as we mentioned, is a very big issue uh, in aging populations. And so in 2002, we did a study called the Adams Study, Aging Demographics and Memory Study, uh, in which uh, we did a very intensive neuropsychological evaluation of about 850 people, a sample from the HRS, and then we took them from the HRS we knew exactly how well we did at representing every part of that population, age, race, uh, by prior cognitive ability. So we could weight that to be very accurately represented by the whole population. We're doing it again in 2016 on a different basis. It's a uh, less expensive uh, interviewer-driven approach to this adventure. We're doing that in conjunction uh, with the MHAS in Mexico, uh, ELSA in England, uh, the uh, Lossi study, which is about to be in India, uh, and hopefully some other partners will be very soon. Uh, so that's a big thing. It's a, a particularly expensive, and you have to extra money to do that. Uh, one of the first things I was involved with when I joined HRS in about 2000 was a study of diabetes, which was about as on the cheap as you could do a specialized study. So what we did was we took people in the HRS who reported having diabetes. We mailed them a questionnaire, which was fairly standard for the time, about uh, how they managed it, how they felt about it, self-efficacy, kind of a standard set of things that people who study self-management of diabetes would focus on. And then for the first time, we tried to do a slower, louder or slower? No, <laughs> you know Americans, so we just stop loud. Yes, <laughs> um, so uh, the, uh, the diabetes study, uh, we sent uh, a mailing to people with a questionnaire to mail back. Uh, and we also sent them a little kit. And that kit asked them to stick their finger and put a spot of blood on a piece of paper and mail that back. Uh, and that went to the laboratory. That was our first biomarker. Uh, testing your work at the KNC, uh, by which we can actually tell objectively how well they were doing in the We've also done mail surveys since about 2001. In between every regular wave of interviews, we send a mailing uh, on different topics. Uh, one of them is kind of fixed, it's on consumption temperature. Uh, which we find too long to do in the main uh, So about 40% of the households do the consumption uh, studies uh, in between. Uh, we've done a lot of things focused on prescription drugs. Uh, most recently on nutrition. Uh, because we're an interdisciplinary study, there's often a lot of jousting back and forth between people in different fields about which one is um, do people like less, uh, which one is more onerous for people to work on. Uh, it's typically hard to find anything people like less than economics or uh, feeling out how much they spend on that things. Uh, but actually asking people to write down how much food they ate of various kinds on this 30-page questionnaire from Harvard uh, 
Hersher group, uh, turned out to be at least as unpopular as most of the economic surveys uh, that we do. But still, we got 7,000 some responses, and we were able to do a pretty good assessment of the nutrition. Uh, we do a lot with administrative linkages, as some of the other studies uh, have mentioned. Uh, administrative linkages apply data more accurately and more easily than you can uh, than asking people to report the same thing. Um, so on an individual basis, we ask people for permission to link to uh, records of their earnings and benefits. So um, one of the points that was made earlier about these types of studies is they're at a real disadvantage in knowing what happened to people before they entered the state. They don't have much direct observation about what they got. Well, from the Social Security record is um, we get their earnings over their entire work life, which tells us the fact that they were working, but also how much they were making. Switch jobs and get them from everyone. So that's incredibly valuable. It's still in the end some of that prior information. Looking the other way, Medicare is a national program of health insurance for people 65 and older. So we ask for reference for that, and that gives us detail about what uh, doctors, services have been provided, and hospitalizations that have occurred, uh, and some information about uh, diagnoses with us. In the U.S., we do have a national index of deaths that compiles death certificates nationally, uh, and it's pretty complete. Uh, and we do to that. Um, it helps a little bit with the county ascertainment. I'll we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, what it's mostly valuable for in terms of the value added is we get good cause of it. Uh, good longitudinal studies that follow people carefully can actually document deaths pretty well when they do. Um, but people can't really report Please. someone's cause of death. Sorry. Thank you. It has to go through your face. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, <laughs> national death index, good. Uh, we get cause of death uh, from the national death index. We're working with the uh, Veterans Administration. There's about 7,000 people in the U.S. who serve in the armed forces and are entitled to use the VA uh, health system. Um, many of them don't. Um, the VA system uh, is not used by people who have other kinds of health insurance offices, um, but we are that We also do work linking employers. So uh, to pension plans to understand what the rules and the benefits are that some people can get entitled to in the pension plan. Uh, and we're also doing some uh, uh, census uh, Up to 2006, HRS was primarily a telephone service. And so some of the content of the study may seem odd to some people uh, because uh, we had to select things that could be done strictly on the telephone. Um, and so the cognition measures, for example, are limited. Uh, in 2006, we made a major change in the survey where we decided to introduce in-person interviewing as a regular thing. Uh, and we did it on a half sample rotation. So this is a random half of the sample was assigned to get an in-person interview in 2006. The other half in 2008, and now they just keep alternating every way who's who gets the in-person. In the in-person interview, uh, we do a number of direct measures, uh, which I'll show in a second, uh, uh, of health and, and biological status. So it's very valuable uh, for that, which we could possibly do. We also use the opportunity to do something that the ELSA study uh, introduced, which was to leave a questionnaire with the respondent following the interview uh, to get some extra content. And both we and they tend to focus that on psychological measures, um, well-being, stress, social support, and that type of thing. So the uh, main components of this new interview included direct measures of height, weight, uh, and waist circumference. Um, a lot of people, when we did this, thought, oh, yeah, it's probably really important to measure people's weight because everybody lies about what they're doing. Um, and so uh, we did some analysis of the self-reported information against the measured information. Uh, and it turns out that the errors on weight uh, were really rather small. Uh, there's 
uh, maybe a small tendency to understate, but it's not very great. Uh, and it doesn't contribute very much to error in BMI. In an older population, where you have more misreporting is of height. And the reason for this is mainly that people think of their height like they do their name. They got it at a certain age and it's going to stick with them forever and they don't want to accept the fact that with aging they are not somewhat smaller. Uh, and so you can see uh, that the tendency with height is for people to over-report height somewhat. Uh, and to be honest, a little more so for men uh, than for women. So, um, that actually turns out to be, in some sense, the more valuable measure to obtain by uh, doing measurement. Uh, and waist circumference, a, a lot of studies do waist-hip ratio. Uh, we didn't do that, partly because some analysis suggests that waist alone is as good at predicting most of the things that waist-hip ratio predicts, and also because in the context of touching the respondent and taking the measurement. Measuring around the waist was fairly benign, but measuring around the hip kind of got people into trouble. So we felt like trained nurses could do that okay, but we didn't really want to uh, introduce that with one of the different nurses. We use an a, a automated cuff to do blood pressure, and that works um, pretty well. Our data, of course, went very well with other national surveys that use uh, other, um, other forms to test it. Uh, we introduced physical performance measures, so walking speed, uh, a fairly short walk, so it can always be done in most homes, um, but it's a pretty good measure of the human ability. Uh, grip strength, uh, which is one of the best single measures you can take to, to identify people who are losing uh, strength. Uh, we do a very simple version of lung function, and also study does detailed spirometry. Uh, we just do what's called a puff test. You blow as hard as you can into this tube uh, and it measures that. And it seems to work pretty well as if you're not trying to do that as a uh, reflection of, for example, smoking. We also do a balance test um, to detect the blood So there was a lot of excitement when we did this around this idea of drawing blood spots. Uh, and um, so as I said, we did the diabetes study and measured with A and C. Uh, so now we're doing this on everyone. Uh, and uh, again, this can be done by a regular interview. Uh, in the US, a regular blood draw from Maine uh, requires uh, certification as a phlebotomist. And so our interviewers were not allowed to do that. The blood spots um, can be done uh, with just an interview. And so we do this, and we, uh, these are the main assays we've done from it, A1C, cholesterol, C-reactive protein, and a kidney marker called cystatin C, which has turned out to be a surprise. Um, the laboratory suggested we do this, and it's been very valuable. It's a, it's a really good um, measure of kidney function and therefore a very good predictor of mortality. One of the things we didn't anticipate when we got into this business, uh, we were very worried about what the respondents do. We actually did. Would interviewers accept the job of doing this? And pretty much they did. In uh, fact, a lot of them were really excited about it. Um, so our side of things went really well. The part I wasn't worried about was the laboratory. And that's where we got a really big headache. So uh, our first headache was we were working with a private company uh, that was one of the few that marketed these tests and had FDA approval to do them, so we trusted them. And indeed, the quality of the work they did was pretty good until in the middle of our 2008 field period, they went bankrupt and called us and said, we're done. Uh, and so we had to actually send a truck to Chicago to their offices to collect the samples that were still sitting there and, and bring them back on dry ice and find a place to store them. And, uh, so it was, it was quite a, uh, a nightmare of organization. And then we had to scramble to find another lab, and then we had to discover the fact that laboratories doing exactly the same assay don't necessarily get the same value. Uh, and so that sort of entire business of doing comparisons across these labs and between the blood spot labs and whole blood labs for the same people. So we now understand much better how all this works and there are ways to sort of adjust the lab results. Uh, um, we 
also collected a, a saliva sample from which we extract uh, DNA. Uh, and that's been uh, one of the big uh, new uh, additions uh, to it. So we will soon have completed about 19,000 people on a two and a half million SNP genome wide scan. Uh, and uh, on top of that, the so exome chip. Um, protein controlling uh, genetic markers. Uh, and the NIH in the West maintains something called DBGAP, which is a distribution portal for genetic data for all our studies, and so we use that to distribute the data in a, in a secure way. So, um, and there's something like 120 approved users already on the genetic data, even though it's not so functionally there. Uh, this coming year, 2016, we have now funding to do a whole blood draw. So the ELSI study, uh, instead of, you know, the way we do alternating face-to-face -to -face to get uses a nurse visit. So they would send a trained nurse to the home, and the nurse would draw blood and also perform some of these other tests that our interviews do. Um, we really struggle with how to do anything like that in the because it's so expensive. In England, you can have a centralized group of these nurses and send them out to places, and they can get back that night with the samples. In the U.S., it's not possible as much as you want. So um, it took us a while to find a group we can work with who can send enough to a lot of us to do this. Uh, so we're very excited about uh, this. And we have a, a fairly ambitious menu of, of assays plan to focus on some of the more interesting things about aging that we learn from the blood, which have to do with the aging of the immune system and the development of inflammatory processes. All right, so um, Rebecca showed this geographically. I'm going to show it uh, in, a, in a different way. Uh, the, the expansion of studies built off of uh, the HRS model. So these are studies which have a similar questionnaire, have uh, met with the public release of data, generally have a nationally representative sample, uh, so are uh, pretty comparable to HRS. So the first one was MHOS here in Mexico. Uh, I, I collapsed odd years and even years just to make it easier to collect. But in 2001, 2003, you had the first two years of the MHOS. Then this long interval before we resumed uh, in 2012 uh, and 2015. The ELSA study in England was the, the next MLR, and they have maintained the every two year rhythm uh, since the first wave. In 2002. Uh, the SHARE study is a very large study. It's a uh, small per country. Most countries have only about 5,000 cases, but it's a lot of countries. So it's a pretty large study. Uh, in the current waves, it's almost 50,000. So it's very large. Um, the next was in South Korea. That was the first uh, Asian uh, HRS like study. Uh, then the uh, Irish study, uh, to, the, to me, probably the, the biggest accomplishment of all of these uh, up to this point was the study in China. Uh, China does not have a tradition of public releasing data. We really don't have a strong tradition of research uh, study sampling. Uh, and this group just built everything from scratch uh, to design their sample, design, actually even the, the listening strategies, how they went out and determined uh, who was in a community uh, and they had to come out for themselves. So it's a really tremendous accomplishment that they have uh, public release data. Uh, India is about to start uh, at the end of this year, and their target is 50,000 interviews, uh, which I wish them well to do. Um, Brazil has actually begun midway through collecting a sample of about 10 to 12,000, uh, and there's a small study beginning in South Africa. Uh, there are some others which Rebecca mentioned, which are cousins, I would say, not sisters of, of HRS. If you look at the DNA, they're not quite as close. Um, but uh, what's interesting to me is that the HRS, which is average about 20,000 interviews every day, uh, will now be multiplied tenfold internationally to about 200,000 interviews uh, in this year uh, and the next. 
So it's a pretty uh, impressive experience. So now I just want to give some examples of some of the research that can be supported by these longitudinal designs. So this may be a surprising one for a developed country uh, to focus on infectious diseases. We think of developed countries, uh, chronic diseases are the only thing that matters now. Uh, but actually, one of the more uh, uh, high-ranking causes of death in the population is substance. That is a very severe infection. It's not just uh, 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 bronchitis or a little cut. Um, it's a, a system-wide uh, infection, many of which would begin as a pneumonia, but uh, they, they become very severe. And uh, doctors knew this was a problem, and knew many people died, but as doctors do, they tended to study people who were in the hospital and whether they survived and got out of the hospital, and they didn't really know much else about the people who were the So, uh, Jack Washington, who's an emergency room physician in Michigan, uh, did this study using the HRS where they were able to look at okay, who gets sepsis and how do they compare to other people uh, in the study. And then once someone has had sepsis, how does their future course compare to somebody else who was otherwise in that And what they found was that uh, controlling for all the things that might predict who got sepsis in the first place, getting it versus not getting it, uh, resulted in really severe decline in cognition and function uh, for those people. Uh, and that had never been demonstrated before, so no one had to follow the data uh, to be able to do that. And so this actually had a pretty big impression on the medical community. So to get to this result, you needed a Medicare record because substance is not something you get from the survey. You had to observe it in the um, we wanted to have longitudinal data before the event of sepsis so you could control for a lot of the characteristics of people. Because you don't want to just compare the sick people who got sepsis to the well people who didn't. Uh, and then you need the longitudinal follow up data. So, another one um, uh, was done by my predecessor as piano teacher, Bob Willis. Uh, there's a lot of interest in retirement age and in manipulating retirement ages with policy uh, as a means of um, helping the public finances uh, in the face of uh, an aging population. Uh, and so the question is, well, what would be the effect on things like health if we actually move people towards later retirement? Uh, and so uh, one of the interesting questions uh, uh, has to do with cognition. So uh, Bob Willis and Suzanne Rowett are uh, exploited the international uh, community of HR studies in order to, to study this. So when you look within a country and say who retires early, who retires late, that's going to be very correlated to things like their health and their cognition. But when you look across countries which have very different retirement policies, you have countries in which people retire early because that's what policy directs them to do. In others, like the U.S., they retire late because policy doesn't really encourage uh, early retirement. So they can use that international variation of policy as uh, an exogenous source of variation of retirement and then look at what happens between the and they find that it uh, delays cognitive decline. So working longer um, seems to promote people staying uh, better cognitively uh, for longer. So again, they needed longitudinal data on cognition that was comparable measure across many countries with different policies. Finally, and this one is stretching a little bit beyond the longitudinal for this, but I think it's an important paper. Um, caring for dementia is an enormous burden on society. Uh, and an important question, and one I hope the international community the just as will help the answer is, how does this vary across countries, but how is the burden shared? How much do families bear the burden? How much uh, goes through the market provided care? Uh, and how much is uh, from well? So um, Michael Hurd and colleagues uh, used HRS uh, to make an estimate of this for the United States. So the cost of dementia are quite high. It's about $200 billion a year for caring for people with dementia. Um, of that, about 
is government supplied health care. So that's Medicare, basically. Uh, so that's people with dementia compared to other people uh, with the, all the other same health conditions cost about $50 billion a year. Uh, the private market, which is mainly um, nursing home insurance uh, that people buy, uh, is another quarter or a little more than what Medicare pays for. But fully half of the burden of caring for medical dementia is family care, not through the market. And how do you get to that estimate, you ask? Well, to assign a value to what someone's wife's effort is worth uh, when she cares for her husband. Uh, and those, you can do that in different ways, and you can get it a different number. Um, they use something like how much would it cost for those number of hours from a higher healthcare worker. Most people prefer to have a family member rather than a higher worker, so the problem is underestimating the value of that population. But it's, it's an important finding when you think about policy because for government to say, for us to say to government, you should take on the full burden of hiring for pension, you're asking them to, to go from 50 billion to 200 billion uh, in the cost if they were to and so what went into this finding, we measure the cognition, uh, the dementia sub-study that we did helped to estimate dementia status, the Medicare spending from the Medicare records, nursing home use from the HRS, and these hours of unpaid care provided by family members also uh, from the HRS. Um, quickly on policy, um, so all of these studies have to be able to and advocate for a particular point of view or a particular set of policies. Um, uh, and we don't want to advertise to our respondents, oh yeah, we're responsible for Obamacare, that was us. Uh, because there's a lot of people who like it and there's a lot of people who don't, uh, and you can't win uh, by choosing a side. Uh, so we don't like to take credit for specific policies, but we do uh, uh, appreciate that we think we contribute to the careful evaluation of policy uh, and keeping uh, policy uh, projections of policy. So the studies used widely at government agencies uh, that have to what call score a policy proposal to value for its impact would be Congressional Budget Office, Treasury, uh, Social Security Administration. Uh, and then it's used by many researchers who also do their own uh, assessments of what uh, policies are uh, To give a couple of examples, so health insurance has been a major area of policy activity in the U.S. As I said, Medicare provides medical coverage to 65 and older, but it didn't used to cover prescription drugs. Um, in 2006, Part D is called Medicare Introduced Prescription Drug Coverage. Uh, HRS contributed somewhat to establishing a need for this. So this shows um, how many people reported not taking all their medications because they couldn't afford them um, as a function of their income level and whether or not they had insurance coverage for their prescriptions. So you see income matters, but also coverage uh, matters. So people who have low incomes and no coverage uh, have pretty high rates and they don't have to take medications that should. Uh, and then some research showed that that can actually be a translation to some uh, health consequences. So we then followed the bar sample through the out the rollout of Part D to look at what happened. We did some special surveys on our prescription drugs using before and after uh, and looked at uh, some other characteristics. So there was a lot of concern because this was basically run through the private sector. This was going to be a very cognitively difficult thing. People weren't going to be able to figure out how to navigate the system. And that turned out uh, to not really be true. Uh, most people uh, managed to do it pretty well. And what you see is the, the take up uh, was lowest among people who really didn't use prescription drugs to begin with and didn't benefit much from it. Uh, and then when you look at the before and after, um, the people uh, who signed up for it um, before they signed up for it had very high spending, and as a result of signing up, had lower spending. The people who didn't sign up for it had before lower spending, and then their spending didn't change much. Uh, so it seems as though people did what we would expect them to do in terms of the cost. 
uh, just briefly all about the care, so the lack of health insurance prior to age 65. There's been some research about what people get in terms of what they don't get and what the implications are for Medicare. So one of the consequences is people in their 50s, when they start to develop a lot of chronic conditions, if they're not getting good care, when they hit 65, then they become more expensive for Medicare to take care of because those conditions have been going on not uh, very well managed. So we'll see whether providing uh, extended coverage will help. All right, so now I'm going to get into some more methodologies. So I mentioned mortality in HR. So we have a sample of about 25,000 people over age 50. They produce roughly two deaths per day. Um, so mortality is a pretty important thing for us. I think it's one of the most important things to know. Um, we try to obtain an interview with the next of kin when we discover someone has died. We ask about what happened since the last interview, um, conditions around their death, uh, his position in the state. And as I said, we went to the death. So uh, one important thing to do is to see whether your mortality looks like it should. So um, for the HRS cohort that started in 1992, if we say how many should still be alive in every future year following the life tables, that's what that graph looks like. And that's what our actual survival looks like uh, from the HRS cohort. So if I take the cohort that was introduced uh, and that was older in 1998, the code they have a steeper decline from that year, uh, and then after that. The uh, more baby cohort that was introduced in 1998 was very young, not many died, but we track that uh, very well. Uh, the one cohort where we don't do perfectly uh, was that a head cohort of people 70 years of age and older, in which our mortality was a little less than the total population. The reason for that is we excluded people who lived in nursing homes from the baseline. In the longitudinal study, we follow people who into nursing homes and attempt to keep them in the study, but at baseline, we didn't improve. So the sample began with a slightly healthier group, and that's what we see in the health. So our mortality ascertainment uh, is um, extremely good. And mortality is important to all the disciplines that use HRS. Everybody cares about that. So sociologists talk about social isolation as a risk factor. You can see people with high uh, measured social isolation have about twice the risk of death uh, as people with low social isolation or lots of social networks. Um, psychologists measure things like personality. More conscientious people have um, lower mortality and people with low measure of conscientiousness. I can also say with the research I've done, um, it matters to your spouse. So even if we're not very conscientious, try to marry someone who is because that helps. Uh, uh, but of course, economists are the king of the social sciences, uh, and so the gradient of wealth is actually the steepest of the things I've shown you, and the bottom quintile of wealth has more than three times the risk of the this is in, in the U.S. I, I wouldn't necessarily generalize that. So. It's also critically important to assessing survey quality. I want to thank Rebecca for sharing some unpublished data uh, from the MHAS uh, so I can um, talk about this with, I hope, a relevant uh, comparison. So um, for the first interwave interval, 2001 to 2003, um, MHAS in 2003 interviewed about 89% of the people who they interviewed uh, in 2001. HRS for the same time period, two years ago, about 88%. So that looks pretty similar. When you look at the different categories of people who didn't do an interview, you see differences. So um, in HRS, our measured mortality is quite a bit higher. Now the HRS sample is probably older. Um, but uh, still, that's a pretty big difference. Uh, I don't want to talk about not eligible. Not eligible uh, is, is not a category. Uh, I, I find it's uh, often used um, to hide my response. Uh, but uh, I'm sure there's some reason why these people are not eligible. Uh, and then you look at loss. And so MHAS lost almost 4% of people that couldn't find them. HRS, very low rates of uh, loss. HRS has higher rates of refusal. MHAS, very low rates. Uh, 
then I look at the tenure gap. So the MOS had this very interesting hiatus. Uh, they had to come back and find the old sample many years later. Uh, and uh, so uh, compare uh, these results. And you see now their interview rate is quite a bit higher than HRS for the same period. Um, but more than all of that is explained apparently by differences in mortality. So HRS had a very high death rate from those groups uh, 10 years earlier. Uh, MHAS uh, did, I would say, a remarkable job of finding people uh, in 2012. But still 7% were not followed successfully. Uh, HRS. Oh, after 10 years, still only about half a percent that we couldn't find uh, in the um, Again, our refusal rates are, are higher, and you see we have this category called the who, which is people who we've had to take out of the study in a permanent manner, uh, about 2%. So conclusion, MHOS is clearly better than HRS at obtaining interviews with no case survival. So I, I understand everyone uh, comes to praise Yenegi, so I would praise Yenegi uh, for uh, their work up in the field work uh, for MHOS. Uh, uh, they, they do a remarkable job of getting um, I think they did a good job locating people. It still appears to be worse uh, than HRS, but it's unclear whether MHOS is as good at determining mortality. Someone asked the question earlier, there's no death index in this, but you can't really verify the survival status of an individual. And so it's hard to tell whether failure to locate is failure to locate a living person who's moved somewhere, or failure to identify a death or someone who's died. Now, use of life tables won't help you on an individual basis, but it will help you understand whether you're missing a substantial number of deaths. So if you were to calculate how many deaths should have been expected from the MHAS sample, over this time period, using the life tables for all of Mexico, you should be able to calculate uh, how many of your lost or really lost survivors and how many of you really lost death. And so it may be, in fact, your location job is actually better. Uh, so uh, now let me talk a little bit about um, methods research on longitudinal studies. And the first thing to say is uh, there's not a lot of it. Um, relative to, I think, the importance of longitudinal studies and the importance of uh, methodological knowledge to how we do that. Uh, and uh, the main reason, I think, is because once you're charged with maintaining a longitudinal study, you don't want to run any risks. Uh, if, you, if you think this is good, you don't want to stop doing it to test the effects of doing it. Uh, you're going to do it. Uh, and so um, it's very hard to make a stop doing something uh, that we believe in. Uh, it's a little bit easier to get studies sometimes to adopt something new if it's been shown to be. Uh, but finding some place that can test it is not always easy. So there is occasionally discussion about creating methods panels and the Understanding Society uh, study in the UK that has, I don't know if they still maintain it, uh, method panel. These are very expensive. You're maintaining a longitudinal study just for the purpose of doing tests of different things. Uh, and it has to be big enough that if you found an effect, it would mean something. It would be statistically meaningful. So it's quite expensive, actually, to, to create test beds to do experiments. And the second thing, then, is that generalizability is, is an issue. So if you had, so the, again, the Understanding Society, that methods panel is very much uh, similar to the main study in terms of who's in it. Um, but if, if you had a methods panel that consisted of a convenient sample, you question whether the findings there are generalized to a full study. And also, internationally, we have to say, things that work in one place may not matter, may not work somewhere else. So often it has to really be specific to the population you're studying. Uh, so I know Miles to look past Cooper and breaking down the steps to the response. So you have to look at people, find them again. Uh, definitely contact with them, which often is full of the first. And then you need to get their cooperation with what you want to do. And at each step, there's some different strategies that you can follow. Uh, and uh, Alfonso also asked to talk about the item on response. I would just say, in, in the modern study like HRS, item on response and cooperation start to become a very uh, confused, uh, worried line. So if someone doesn't do blood tests, uh, 
Is this item not response or non cooperation or part of the survey? So it becomes uh, quite a blurry distinction. Uh, so, Cooper and Ostal raised some ideas about uh, how to get information about rules between your interest and your rules. Um, the HRS, we rely mainly on an electronic source of passive tracking. Uh, the post of the office will indicate some of the address has changed. Um, um, but it does pretty well, and then we do an active tracking if we're unable to find someone we're expecting when we start the field. Group. I understand Negi from Empos actually went out in advance and tried to locate everybody first before they sent them. That would be pretty expensive, I think, in the U.S. Uh, so studies have mainly experimented around getting respondents to tell you where uh, and usually that takes the form of sending a letter or a postcard with a, a return of mail uh, to send in their information. And so there's options about how to encourage them to return that card. There's been some experimentation with that. The British Household Panel Study, which is now part of the uh, Understanding Society, had uh, uh, an experiment with how much incentive and how to deliver the incentive uh, to get people to do this. So you can send them a card and say, please send back. Uh, and if they did that, they have a seven percent uh, response rate. Um, if they sent uh, with the request uh, a gift card voucher, which is the usual uh, um, they got a forty percent response. Uh, and if they said, "Well, we'll send you this gift card," if you send that card, they actually got lower. Uh, and I don't know if this is well established, accepted as a general phenomenon, but. I am a pretty firm believer that in a longitudinal study, paying people in advance for something that they're asking them to do is a more effective strategy than saying we'll pay you after the fact if you do it. Uh, PSID uh, in the US also did an experiment. Uh, they didn't find much different effect from different settings uh, or designing materials in different ways. Uh, but in the group that they mailed to twice, they got a better response. So reminding people, it turns out, uh, can be helpful. But I also have to know, the overall rate of return to PCD was much higher than in the BHPS. So it may be that the incentives um, weren't operating at that high level of response. All right, so now let's talk about design strategies to reduce attrition and improve cooperation. I want to share with you the biggest insight I know in the last 40 years of research. If you want to retain people in your study, don't drop them from your study. This seems like a pretty obvious point, uh, but early on, many longitudinal studies uh, were on these, this very fast annual basis, uh, and if someone missed one, that was it. They didn't try to go back and find them. Uh, and so that was essentially a, a first non-response was defined the same as any other attrition. In current practice, it's very important to distinguish between someone refusing to do the interview this time and someone who's required to do the permanently uh, from their study. Uh, the effects of this have been studied for the HRS uh, in a kind of uh, simulated way. Um, they took the 2004 sample uh, and looked at how biased the sample was from attrition that occurred between 1992 and and found that the people who had actually dropped out uh, were not very different from the people who stayed in. There was not much bias in the sample. Then they said, well, let's imagine that HRS had never gone back to people who had missed away. They were out to take those people out of the sample. Then you get a, not only a smaller sample, but a more biased sample. So it turns out that this practice of trying to go back and get people who missed more and more waves uh, is uh, pretty successful at both maintaining the same size uh, and its representatives. Our experience is someone who missed last wave, we get maybe 30 to 35 percent response the next wave. Uh, but then again, the wave after that, we get maybe 30 percent response. So if you keep trying, you bring them back in, uh, and cumulatively, it ends up to uh, a lot. 
Um, other things that studies do are strategies to maintain interests, so study newsletters are, are pretty common in longitudinal studies. Try to make participants feel they belong to something that's bigger than themselves. Uh, show them the value of the research that comes from the data. Uh, there's been some experimentation with targeting the message, particularly in studies that are very diverse in terms of age or other characteristics. Um, maybe the younger people want to hear something different from older people, so you tailor Social media is something people talk about. Uh, it's certainly a way to engage people. From my perspective, it's also a good way to risk their confidentiality uh, and identity. So we do not uh, use social media uh, with our participants. Another idea that had some currency, in fact, uh, HRS research had, had promoted this, um, was that using the same interviewer as you did the previous one with that subject, uh, was beneficial to response. We maybe established some rapport with the person and we trust this person. This would be better than the um, But uh, prior wave interviewers uh, who are still with you tend to be the better ones. The ones who aren't still with you are the bad ones, and the ones you just hired are less experienced. So there actually was an experiment uh, done by Peter Lynn and others um, where they randomly designed their wave two to assign people to the same interviewer or not. Uh, and they graded the interviewers just in three categories based on experience and ability. And what they found was that the interviewer quality did matter, the better interviewers got better responses. Uh, but conditional on that, the same interviewer didn't make any difference. So if you're replacing the good interviewer with a bad interviewer, yes, that was a bad idea. Um, but if you're replacing a good one with a good one, it didn't matter. If you're replacing a bad one with a good one, it actually could be better. So uh, worrying about matching the same interviewer doesn't seem to be terribly important. Um, another issue, this is uh, a little more uh, narrowly focused. When we introduced our finger stick blood test in 2006, we had substantially lower cooperation from African Americans than whites. Um, and uh, the race of the interviewer uh, didn't matter. That racial difference between the respondents was there. In 2008, we did better, um, and particularly so with African Americans. Um, there's still a gap. Um, and again, in 2008, race matching the interviewer to respondent made no difference. What seemed to matter was just that all the interviewers got better training by then had some experience, so they, they did better in general. Uh, and it seemed as though the black respondents were perhaps more sensitive to interviewers not being confident about this new procedure. Um, another one which is more specific to aging studies uh, is cognition and non response. So there's a lot of studies about what are the characteristics of people or households that predict to non response. Uh, the income, or education, or many things. Um, and uh, one of all those things, the one that translates directly into the ability to do the survey is cognition. People who are beginning to have cognitive impairment find these surveys very different, uh, and they will not do that. Uh, and you need to keep those people in your study if you want to be able to study the effects of so um, a proxy is someone who completes an interview on behalf of someone else who won't work uh, And HRS has, has a completely established protocol for proxy interviews. Um, it turns out this makes a big difference. So the ELSA study in its early ways did not do proxies much at all. Uh, and so the blue bars there show you the wave, the next wave non-response as a function of cognition prior way. So people who scored badly on the cognitive tests in the prior way had very high non response at the next way in ELSA. Uh, and then it flattens out the HRS is those teal colored thing, uh, squares at the bottom. And when we include the proxy interviews, it's almost flat. There's essentially no relationship between the cognitive status and getting at least some kind of interview. But if we take the proxies out, we have the same pattern as the ELSA study. Um, finally, I left this controversial one to the end, and I'll try to do this quickly. Financial incentives vary widely. 
be very widely within the HRS family. So, so HRS can, can be sent a check and also a gift card to share with us a question um, on his boss's problem there. Um, Charles, the China study actually uses the same as the second. Uh, Mexico, Brazil, India, no. You use eyeglasses. Yeah, uh, reading glasses. Uh, rather few experiments have been done. Uh, in general, uh, it doesn't seem to make a big difference uh, for us and for the very existing cases. Uh, general observations, uh, they seem to matter most in where our attachment is lowest. Uh, and interviewers are often good substitutes for the natural incentives. Uh, but the ALC is a benefit of one. Uh, we one. Um, they got a 10% boost from 20 versus 0, but also a 10% boost by the following. All right, so summary on the coach's nutrition. Get the best interviews you can. Get back to every other time. Use proxies. Engage with spines. Use incentives uh, if you think they help. Um, I'll skip through live and response if you have questions after you do it. I just want to say longitudinal studies. Uh, I guess you They say that probably each one of them or the combination of them could lead to uh, some kind of bias. I mean, because direct interview, telephone interview, and mail surveys, they have different biases. Yeah. And when you combine them, uh, that could cause a, a, some little yeah. trouble. How do you solve that? Yeah. So let me, let me tell you why I know what I think about that. So uh, because HRS was going to do well, so the baseline was always in person. the person. We established that person, and then for the first ten years, always telephone. Except for older people, or sometimes find health difficult when they're off with in person. So we were very concerned with the road differences between telephone and in person. And so there's a lot of studies. We actually did some experiments where people were randomly assigned to one or the other. Small sample. Conclusion was between telephone and in person for the question that we were asking, there was not much difference, not much more. Where we almost always will find the motive is between anything that's interview or administered, where the subject is speaking to a person, versus they do it themselves on a piece of paper or by the internet. Uh, and typically, what you find is for a thing.
things that I think of as relatively objective. Yeah. Do you have my blood pressure? Or has the doctor told you? It doesn't matter. For things like, do you love your spouse? Uh, it turns out it matters more. Uh, everybody loves their spouse when you talk to the interview. Uh, when you fill it out on a piece of paper or the internet, a few don't. Uh, so, you know, it's, so psychological questions, sensitive questions, uh, and, and my feeling is, ironically, often the self administered is more honest uh, than going through the interview for those kinds of questions, which is why I like the model of using these leave behind written questionnaires for the psychological measures. I do, I understand in countries that people don't like or read. Yeah, I have a second question that uh, from Pip, most of the researchers, um, uh, they, I've seen some res uh, longitudinal research that uh, they, um, uh, with no, uh, some experience or few experience, they change the wording of the questions. So in a way that we cannot compare it any longer. <coughs> What's your suggestion regarding the, the, the change of world or, or improvement of the questions over time? We've, we've been working with colleagues in Thailand who uh, finished an HRS type survey in Thailand, the baseline. Uh, and working with them, trying to get things translated and find out what they actually did. So it turns out uh, the job of an interviewer in Thailand is actually a kind of sophisticated, artisan, craft activity. And what some of these interviewers say they do is they memorize the question. They go to the house with a blank piece of paper. They ask a bunch of questions, have conversations however they want. And then they go back and fill in the questionnaire with what they think were the answers from the house. Um, so this makes you know someone who works in a modern survey or social organization gasp for breath because we spend a lot of time training interviewers you know, don't go off script. You, know, you write these questions this way for a reason, read the question, uh, and you know, record the answer. And we do things like take the record a certain number of hours and play them back and the feedback of interviewers and see if they're doing it correctly. Um, so uh, it's, this varies widely. Um, I don't know that you couldn't do a pretty good job of finding out about something from having a relaxed, lengthy conversation. Um, it's just not the way I do, do survey research. So um, you, some studies are maybe more in the middle. If there's some questions, but the interviewers feel free to reinterpret them and ask them in a different way. And I'm also a little reluctant to turn off interviewer intelligence. Um, you know, they sometimes can understand if the person is getting the point of the question or uh, help them uh, to get there. So you don't want to make it just a machine question. Either. So it's a, it's a tough trade off. We have time for another question. Um, I actually got one. <laughs> um, uh, I remember that. Uh, uh, when I contacted you, um, I remember I said, you know, I did no response, and you need um, no response. It's a kind of important thing, especially in developing countries. Um, was at the time where I talked to uh, policy makers or data generators, they say, we don't do longitudinal in Mexico because we can't. We can't follow people. This is not America. This is not a UK. People here is very difficult to attack. So, what uh, experiences or uh, what um, strategies uh, could HRS tell us about that? Uh, should we really fear that it is impossible to do it in Mexico because of this? Because, uh, because we are going to lose people very fast, and it's difficult, they don't give interviews, uh, I, I, I think this is why I really encourage uh, MLS to take a look at the mortality thing, uh, to be sure you have an accurate measure of how many people you're actually losing. 
Now, it is true in the U.S. where we have a system of social security numbers uh, that help you track people, um, where we have a lot more electronic surveillance of everything, um, it is easier for us to find people from the U.S. than Mexico. You also have um, many more people migrating out of the country, uh, which creates a, a different challenge. So um, the environment in Mexico clearly is tougher to work in, uh, but it seems as though uh, a good effort uh, pays off, and it seems to me the best response is the old evidence of best practice in Mexico. Uh, I would say, you know, if, if it's possible to mail something to people in between the waves, I don't know how it works with the Mexican post office. If someone has moved, if we don't know it, it'll come back to us. No, this doesn't happen. So, you know, so I'm suggesting things that already they're going. <laughs> Thank but, you, but I'm happy, you know, I work with Rebecca, uh, and I'm happy to talk more concretely about specific studies. And of course, I, I deal with a study of older people, which is very different from studies of younger people. Thank you, David. Uh, I have question for I have the time for another question. <laughs> yes. Oh. Yes, I just wanted to uh, comment a little bit more about the question. Uh, in our experience here, in, in, in MXFLS, we were able to recontact 88% of the original baseline of the individuals in a 10 year period. Of course, you need a lot of resources, and you need to have special interview uh, teams that are committed to really to locate and track the people and convince people to do the, sorry, the, the, the answers. And there are many, many ways that you can do that. You don't need to bribe people or for them to be willing to, to answer your, your instrument. But for example, in our experience, since we have health measures, we like to put health measures up front in the, in the instrument before economic uh, questions regarding it. And that helps us a lot. Because then people think that we care about them and they are more open to answer later on more difficult questions. Right? And um, we were able to track individuals including uh, to the United States and that was feasible by conducting a parallel of field work in Mexico and in the US in order to be able to track and locate those people who really were. And the, those were very difficult situations because first we had to convince original council members to tell us where the relative was in the US. Second, we, would, we needed to validate the location of the information we were gathering because sometimes they said, oh yes, he or she is in Washington, D.C. He or she was in, is in, in Fresno, D.C. You know, of course, that Fresno was in California, and D.C. is in Fresno. And thirdly, once we pinpoint where the location in the U.S. that person was, we had to, to, to track them within the community and convince the individual that we were a reliable source to provide information to us because that person could be afraid and we were able to do it. So my answer is yes, we can do longitudinal surveys in Latin America with difficult citizens. Alfonso, one thing I should have mentioned, which is very obvious to most people who do these things, get the information about friends and family who don't know where they are. The first thing people do when they start to track someone who's not where they were is call those people and find those the most effective strategy on that we should be able to do well. Thank you. Uh, yes. uh, I have one. Oh, yes. We have. Uh, regarding the, the, the missing data problem, um, uh, I, I would like to really underline what you said, which is not to discourage the researchers no. from uh, dropping out of uh, specific person because uh, no, no. Uh, they drop out from uh, one, one way to the next. Uh, because uh, today we can handle 
uh, even if we have a, a data at one point and trying to recover that person later on, that will allow us to deal with missing data. Because today we have more methodologies to deal with missing data. Uh, there are, uh, as you know, in the literature, a lot of uh, uh, methods to deal with that. And uh, actually, is, is the, the message is not to discourage the researchers from uh, conducting longitudinal studies because they're going to miss uh, some person. But in the future, uh, you can recover them and deal with the statistical analysis with missing data, which uh, is better to do so than losing the, the person and losing the power of the study. Absolutely. I agree. Um, the other thing I had put in but didn't talk about, uh, an item non-response, which some people view as an argument against the any kind of First of all, uh, you have to have an item non-response. It's very important to let people not answer a question you don't want to answer, uh, because otherwise their only option is to not do the whole circle. So you need to have this. Uh, you just need to have methods for how to do adjust for the basic plan, and, and so there are a number of techniques we've developed, particularly on economic variables, that help capture a lot of that basic information in ways that this problem is not Hi, um, so I just had a comment on the, um, on what you said around kind of experimentation in survey methodological research. Um, so I would fully agree that we definitely need more kind of experimental um, studies, um, but as you said, not everybody is going to be able to have an innovation panel like Understanding Society has. So, but I think that shouldn't necessarily stop us from doing experiments in, in our studies. Um, I, I work in, in London on the, some of the kind of large cohort studies that we have in the UK. And we've been able to, and I think when you do have a kind of large sample, you can actually um, embed experiments in the main stage of your data collection without kind of a huge amount of risk. I think that you're right, we're very risk averse. We don't really want to change things when we're in longitudinal surveys, but I think we do need to kind of constantly reflect on whether what we're doing is, a, you know, is this a good, the best, or, or, you know, particularly in the context of kind of declining response rates and increasing costs, you know, are we really using the resources effectively and I think embedding experiments in, in kind of the main, main stage data collection is something that can, can be done. I would encourage, I'd be interested in whether that's been done in any of the Mexican studies and I certainly would encourage the, you to do, consider doing that because, um, yeah, I think we're unlikely to all have a kind of my observation about a lot of the studies in the UK is there seems to be a better integration of people with real methodological interests in the management and conduct of the survey. So it's not that we would necessarily oppose doing the conduct. It's that somebody actually has to sit down and say, all right, gee, how would we design this and what would we learn? Is this power to actually get something? Uh, and that resource is scarce. So um, I agree with you. So I, I think things that create better conversation between yeah, the people and the social energy is a good thing. Yes, actually, um, you know, the, this topic of putting together experiments in longitudinal data, I, I think it's quite exciting. Um, I think Susan Parker will talk about it tomorrow uh, about that connection. Um, okay, so um, I think um, if you really press me, I can take another. Question or uh, we have a longer break? Longer break? Okay, longer break. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was a fantastic um, talk. Um, so we should be back at. Sixteen hours. Yeah. Uh, that's two.